semester. Uh, welcome everyone, especially welcome Object, who always comes with great, great energy. We are guests in the town, so uh, our guest is uh, uh, invited from Julie's and Metals, and I'll introduce uh, an Object student in a second who will introduce our guest. Um, I want to highlight um, the talks coming up in the next couple weeks. We have uh, Center, we have a lot of Many Arts Now talks right in a row, no interruptions. So every next Wednesday you come, the next three Wednesdays, you're going to have a visiting artist. So spread the word. Um, obviously, the students are always here. Uh, but tell others. Every Wednesday night, we have a visiting artist. We have, uh, next week, we have uh, Shira Kumar. who's coming up from the Art Institute in Chicago, who's a printmaker. He was here last last um, last spring for the Southern Graphics Print Conference and made a lot of great connections. He was down in New Mexico, uh, at University of Mexico for a while, so he is coming next week to present on his work. Uh, October 2nd, we have Chip Thomas coming, who uh, is a photographer slash street artist slash doctor, uh, living on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, October 9th, we have one of the Noel recipients, uh, Faith Levine, who's very much a hometown hero in Milwaukee, uh, who is a champion of the DIY uh, craft movement. Um, and started Arts vs. Craft, has created two films. Uh, I, what I'm trying to express is we have um, a, a real great uh, diversion of different types of art, art practices. Every Wednesday is completely different, and that's shown forth from our first five guests of the semester. So please, uh, be here and spread the word. Uh, if your if your fellow students, you know, hype it up is what I'm trying to say. Hype up artists now because last week was phenomenal. Tonight's already phenomenal. Next week's going to be phenomenal. It's it's a very interesting program. We're very lucky to have artists come from all over the country and visit us and share their work, their lives, and you folks share your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to invite up uh, Alyssa Fedor, who's going to introduce our guest tonight. which is 
the largest guild of American jewelers in the Western Hemisphere. And we'd like to welcome the name.
So, um, you know, a spoon is more than a spoon. It has layers of meaning and associations with it. Um, so it's not limited by its utility. And that's what really made me interested in this work. So up until this point, I was using found objects just kind of in my work, but not dealing with the objects themselves. I was using them just as moments in my work. And up in, so it was at this point that I was like, I really want to deal with that object. So I wanted it to be as much about the object as the idea. And so my interaction with it sometimes is heavier than other times. And so this is a corkscrew. Um, and you'll see a lot of body parts, which I'll talk about in a minute. But something that was really inspiring to me was Clive Dillnott. Um, he put an exhibition on at Harvard in their gallery, in their museum. And it was, what if anything is an object? And so there's different, I feel like I can't look at that. Okay, you know what? I can't live with that. Okay, this is way better. So, um, is that too much? I'm obsessing over this, but I hate when people scream at me when I'm supposed to be relaxing and listening. Um, but essentially, he used the artifacts within the museum and he set them up in these different moments. So there is the cognitive, the decorative, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the other moments, but um, basically everything revolved around the hand of Mademoiselle Cunier, which is by their Grand Cousy. And so you can see the representational, the decorative, the cognitive, and the functional. Um, so there were 65 objects that he used and he distributed them in these key moments, these four key moments. And what he does is he essentially relates everything, those 65 objects, he relates to this one object. And so if you look at the sculpture, it's both representational, it's a hand, it's functional, it looks like a knife or a tool, um, and it's cognitive, it's decorative. Um, so I found this to be really fascinating. In his article on uh, what, if anything, were an object, I recommend it. it's a very good read. Um, I don't know where he's teaching now, but I think he used to be at the Art Institute of Chicago um, for a while. So, and he has written several um, essays, books. Uh, I'm also interested in the artist Shindagu, which is a Japanese um, word, and it just means otter distorted tool. And so it's a group of these people that kind of come together. Has anybody seen the 500 Unuseless Japanese Inventions? It's an awesome book. But, and and they, they continue to add to it, but it's a group of people that are kind of inventors. But um, basically what I love about this is it's a form of nonverbal communication. We can all understand this work, and we don't need language at all to get in the way. Plus, I love the humor, like the forward-backward looking glasses. Come on, how awesome is that? Or the baby? I needed this one, and my son was like, you know, six months. <laughs> it's just everything about it. Oh, they're fantastic. Please, it's a cheap um, book. It's something like $8. It's really inexpensive on Amazon. Um, but basically, the, some of the rules is you can't debase the sanctity of life. So it can't be crude and vulgar, um, you know, uh, inventions. Um, and, but that's what the two things that have really inspired me, that and just my daily interaction with objects. Um, and so, as I was saying, I'm wondering if a spoon can be more than a spoon. And um, I, I gravitate towards spoons, I don't know what it is about them, but I think that it's, you know, there's something nurturing about a spoon, and it, a lot of my work deals with the mouth and that area of the body, and I see that as an extension of that. And so I love the spoons coddling one another, like the baby, the big spoon and the baby spoon, or even the two spoons with the, the baby spoon and the adult spoon with the, um, the time piece in between. It says a lot. I, you know, it talks about the, the difference in time and, and um, how time goes so fast. And you know, it's a really interesting, for me, um, pairing and juxtaposing objects together create new meaning. And that's what I'm trying to get out with these. Um, this is another one, and some of, oh my god, these are so easy to make, but so hard to think about. Um, I, like everything I ever learned in Intro to Metals has informed this work. There's nothing here other than maybe some casting, um, technique-wise, that's really that incredible. Um, but thinking about them is a whole different story. Like trying not to be, trying not to give the viewer too much, but just enough to understand and 
create those relationships um, is really important. Oh, and just a little bit about my metals background. I have an MA in metalsmithing, I have an MA in sculpture installation, but I remember being in undergrad school and walking by the metal studio and think, oh my god, those people are nuts. Why would you sit there and saw for that long or file? And I was like, I will never do that, ever. <laughs> and I, I told myself this. And then I got into grad school and I wanted to meet my advisor, who was Sue Amendolora. Um, and I thought, I need to get to know her. So I took an intro to metalsmithing class for graduate credit. And then it was just, I'm uh, at the dark side after that. It was just like. <laughs> You know, I, oddly enough, I think I have ADD. I, I know that I have some attention issues, and it really does focus me. Um, when I'm at the bench, I can really focus and hone in, and it's a really meditative time for me to think about a lot of different things, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, as we move on, but I want to show you a few more of these. Um, so this is a, you know, a can opener, which is kind of enlarged. So in some of these, I'm kind of disrupting the function of the object, um, or I'm, the bottom one is man walking upright and the level, and so, or I'm playing metaphorically with the object, um, and sometimes you'll see my body parts in it because objects are an extension of us. If you think about a band-aid, it's analogous to skin. A chair supports your spine, so their objects are providing things that our body isn't providing uh, at the moment. and. Um, so that's why you'll see a lot of the, the body parts in, in the piece. And here you can see my crooked teeth. <laughs> my mom gave me the choice in high school, either braces or Carnegie Mellon to go to art school, and I chose Carnegie Mellon first. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, I kind of regret it on and off, but not really. Um, but here you can see that, um, you know, like I said, it's providing what nature didn't give. And I love, um, kind of playing with, we all chew our nails, why do we need nail clippers, you know. Some of them are more funny, some of them are one-liners, some of them are deeper than that, and I'm not showing you all of them, but it's it's been really interesting, it's a really good study. Um, and that's the way I see it, I kind of see them as sketches. I love this idea of making little pudding pies or little cakes <coughs> and you already have the thumbprint in it, or the fingerprint how that irks people, <laughs> feel like that and the icing. So I mean, there is a humor involved as well. Um, and so a, a lot of times I'll use text, and I'm really leery of text. I find text to be very hard to deal with um, because it overstates things um, very easily. And um, But I really love this idea of, I forget who I was talking to today, as soon as you pick up that object and that tool, it becomes fully realized. <coughs> And that tool is no longer a static object. It's no longer a noun. It becomes a verb. It becomes action-oriented. And I feel that way of myself, too. There's one of these pieces where it's a mirror that says verb. I don't feel that Renee is a noun. You know, I feel that I'm a verb. I'm an active individual in the world. And I feel like objects are the same way. So, um, Also playing with the idea of beauty and that line between um, beauty functionality uh, became really interesting. I have a lot of um, even uh, cake servers and knives where the scroll work and that intense ornamentation around objects becomes overwhelming to the object to the point where it becomes unusable. Um, and I also do a lot of piercing and I'm on sabbatical now so I'm trying to learn Illustrator. So, actually I'm so glad I didn't Photoshop so it's been really helpful. Uh, but I know it seems like so simple, like, oh god, she's learning Illustrator, but um, it's more than that. I'm doing other things as well, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not just Illustrator. Um, yeah, so because I'm, my body's falling apart. My, I have tennis elbow, my hands, my thumb, my core ligament before, so I really need that technology to assist me in making some of my work where I'm really doing highly pierced forms. Um, this one is from Vietnam, and I love this piece. Uh, I think this might be in Chicago. There is a museum there that houses kind of uh, artifacts that are an artwork that's kind of made off the cuff, or made out of bullets, or made out of things that the guys had in the field. And you can see where humor becomes a huge element in terms of survival. And I firmly believe that if we can't laugh at ourselves and we can't laugh at our situation, then we're, you know, in a lot of trouble. So 
you should be able to do that. And this is a really great example of that. Um, so, and understanding and reading the language of the object becomes very important. So, I mean, not to be crass, but the spoon goes in your mouth, and then so does the other thing on it. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's kind of humorous. Um, so this is just a typical example of um, what the work looks like on display. It's very clean. Um, my background is in installation art, and um, I always think about display. I'm, I'm very um, attracted to things that are well displayed. And um, with this one, I really did want to just keep it about the object. So I kept it like tabletop level, very simple. And there's, like I said, 40 of them that move around the gallery space. And I think this is the last one I have to show you. So I really threw this work. I'm hoping that, you know, I know it does it for me, but I'm hoping for the viewer that it creates this, um, transforms us in the way that we think about objects. That objects allow us to think um, conceptually, they allow us to not just think in a concrete way, but they open the doorways for something more. And that's what I'm really hoping that it does. That and, you know, there's this really nice balance of still understanding the object, but also my interaction with it. And I'm hoping those things are kind of seamless. Uh, and so I, when I got this object, I couldn't figure out what it was, so it's a little hard when you're trying to interact with it. And I had a lot of people give me things from Salvation Army, or you know, I had friends who were like, oh, I don't want this any bit anymore. And so I would sit with the object for a while and, and, and think about my relationship to it. But, um, it, you know, it was, you know, I didn't know what this was, but I knew that it moved. I didn't know if it was a piece of cutter or if it was something that you marked out with. But I thought that repetitive blah, 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 you know, as it rolled was really interesting and kind of playing on the the um, ambiguous function of the object. Um, and then for a while, well, in the beginning, I was also doing, um, I've done a series on war. I've, I've gone to Europe and interviewed veterans that were in World War II in Vietnam, and um, I, I attempted to illustrate their stories. Um, I've also done survival mechanisms, like gas masks and things like that, but I don't really um, show those works, but this uh, has also kind of culminated in um, this body of work, which are devices for contemplation. So they're all scissors or tools, and I'm thinking of my interaction with it. So you can see that it's primarily metal with some found object, and um, and this work, the metal is very light because it's, it's kind of delicate. Uh, in this piece, I'm really interested in the awareness of performing. So I really love this idea of wondering what those two things sound like when they hit one another and what that, what happens there. And um, I'm really interested also in the senses. And I think that the senses are um, de-intellectualized. I think this is the way that we take in information and it is a very intellectual activity. And it really um, forms how we deal with the world. And so that kind of thing, you'll see a lot of things kind of coming together, whether it's something hard or something soft, but it's that kind of space in between that I'm really interested. Um, I grew up, so thinking about objects performing, I grew up Catholic, and um, there is nothing like growing up Catholic to see objects perform. And um, wow, I mean, there's just so much there. There's so many great, I, it's also my first time thinking abstractly, like, how can God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit be one thing? And then if you're a kid, and you're like trying to wrap your mind around it, and it's overwhelming. And, um, but I think it's my first introduction to really thinking abstractly. Um, and uh, also thinking metaphorically. And um, so you can see, um, I also love the censer, which is uh, a physical manifestation of prayer. That's what that incense really is. And I find that to be really beautiful, and it interacts with the senses. And uh, the, you know, when they turn the the um, the bread, the wafer, and the wine into the body and blood of Christ, I find that to be really fascinating too, because everyone in in the church at that moment is part of that activity, and it is really powerful. I think you know, you do it every Sunday, and you forget the power in it. I also think it's a great metaphor, but my mom will argue with me about that. But um, it's still, regardless, it's beautiful. So, um, and so there was no great objects in the Catholic Church. Um, so I'm also playing off dividers, pliers, scissors, that, that thing where 
do you ever like use scissors and you're just kind of cutting along and enjoying it and just all of a sudden you realize you're not really thinking about what you're doing. You're thinking about something else and so it becomes contemplative and meditative and I love those moments when you interact with an object where it becomes about something else and that's really what this work is about is meditation and contemplation. And then these, that's um, Easy Flow 60, which is from Polytech. It's a quick setting plastic that I talked about today, but it had gone bad. And, but I like the little dimply, pimply ripples on the skin. I thought it was kind of fascinating. But those of you that grew up with the electric company, where it was like the, and somebody said at, and then the word went together, I love that. And I remember being a kid, <coughs> are so close together, it's so intimate. Like I thought that whole experience was just really beautiful. It still sticks with me. I don't even know if that's on anymore. It's a shame. But yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's a new version of the new actor. Is it really? Oh. But they do the same thing. Yeah, with the it's a great way to learn. Um, but yeah. I was really fascinated by that whole interaction and that intimacy in that moment. Um, and then, you know, this piece, you'll see a lot of feathers as well. I think that birds are very inspiring to me in their feathers and the delicate quality of them, but the intense structure of them, uh, I find to be really fascinating. <coughs> but you can see that I really enjoy different colors of metal. So if I'm doing something that's more light and delicate in topic I, and, and more contemplative, I'll use silver. I just think there's something ephemeral about silver and beautiful and the way it reflects. And, um, holds the eye, and then other times I'll use darker metals um, like copper, patina, and lac, um, where something is a little bit more morose. And, um, but I also like within a piece playing with brass, bronze, silver, and just kind of fascinated with the color of the metal because color isn't really something that I work with in my work um, unless it's a found object. So I'm really, um, the metal is kind of my palette and the patinas that are available. Um, so I teach with Beth Seely. I love her. She says every time I should choose, that looks like a sex toy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she's like, yes. I'm like, well, I don't know where your mind's at, but I see it that way. Um, but it's really that interaction. Um, so I'm going to move on quickly. Studies in the ephemeral. <laughs> <laughs> um, studies in the ephemeral are where I was playing with toys, and so tools. And are very similar. Like, you know, tools are, you know, they're very functional and do incredible things, but they operate in the same way that toys do for children. Um, they're a learning, or it's a way of learning through the, through the toy. And so in essence, you know, when a kindergartner goes off, or a preschooler, they're playing, right? But that's work. That's their work. And I, I feel that way about these pieces as well. Um, and so there was a variety. I get, I'm very scattered, so I have to give myself rules, and I have to work within a series. Because if not, I'm just like, you know, I'm looking at that sign, and then I'm looking at this light. Like, it's just ridiculous. It's like focus, you know? Like, uh, so I need to do that for myself, otherwise I'm completely lost, because the world is wonderful in, turn, you know, in so many ways, but especially in all the things that are available to us. It's overwhelming. Um, so this is, you know, I do a lot too with um, just about my process. I do a lot with casting, um, fabrication, uh, found objects, but I love casting. I love what happens conceptually. It's like when you cast something and you alter it and you turn it into something very permanent. So it's like bronzing baby shoes. You know, that idea is like really making it special. And I feel that's what casting does. Um, I'm sorry I keep looking here, but I like to see the work, but if I go like this, you can't hear me. <laughs> or my back's to you. So, um, so I apologize, but I, I like to look at the work. It reminds me of things. Uh, with Groucho Marx glasses, buttons, um, lollipops, the lips are from, you know the tongue that comes out, the plastic thing that you can suck on the tongue? That's what that's from. Mm -hmm. um, parts of bubble blowers. And I do a lot of um, uh, collaging, I guess you would say. I have a lot of objects laying around and I really do consider myself a bit of a collage artist. I draw a little bit, but I don't, you know, drawing kind of stresses me out. You know, I'm not one with it. So I'm embarrassed to show you my sketchbook. Uh, but I do it regardless. If I have to work something out, 
Um, so I really like the contrast between this physical object and the ephemeral quality of the bubbles. Um, and so bubbles are so amazing. They're like snowflakes. Um, they're, they are very different from one another, and it's this idea of like, uh, like there it is, and then it's gone. It's just like life. Like, you're here for a very short time when you consider the span of, of the world and all of that. So, not to depress you or anything, but you're not going to it. so, It's pretty terminal, so you're born dying. Uh, so just become one with it and everything's fine. Uh, but I love this quote, bubbles thus become the stock and trade of sign, the signs of ephemera. Their meaning had for centuries perversely included both that of childhood innocence and inevitable death, coming into being and passing away. I feel the same way about snowflakes. And so I have a lot of tattoos of the people that have passed away in my family and their snowflakes, because we're all different, we're temporary, and then we're done. Um, and so this work, I was talking about death before I even realized it, I think. And um, just talking about how fragile life is and how impermanent it is, but how funny it is. You know, it's, it is really funny. So I love this one because it pops itself. It's kind of, um, you know, really nasty. It's like, yeah, blah, 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 popping it. Yeah, so there's some fun here, um, you know, with the bubbles. And I was really excited. I know bubbles are really simple to make. And I thought, oh, I never, it's not a lot of metal. You know, I'm thinking the metal's going to pop the bubble, you know, but it actually could work, so, um, and it was quite fun. Um, sometimes I get really kind of narrative and metaphorical about things and, um, it, it, and tell a story in a way, but this is um, etched images of myself as a child, so I'm kind of blowing the bubbles through this wand, and it's like a pinwheel and it moves. Um, but I do, I get on these things and I'm like, oh, hand fan? I'm going to make ten of them. Like, I just like the idea of exploring that form until I feel like it's time to move on. I get the question a lot, like, well, how do you know when you're ready to move on? And I, I don't know. It just organically feels like it comes to an end, and then you're on to something else. Or it makes you think of something else, and it stimulates another idea. Um, I did this. I took a workshop. I hate raising. hate raising. <laughs> I hate what it does to my arm. I'm a baby about it. I hate moving metal. And I, you know, it's like clay. I have trouble with clay because it's like all you know, same thing with moving metal, so it just, but I took a workshop with my own and with Trey and I made this. And so it, essentially it's an upside down tea spout. Um, but I kind of played with it. And I love that also the fragility of the glass and the fragility of the bubble and, and the entire thing was um, very delicate. I really enjoyed making this piece. And then the bottom part, the handle, it's the thing you use to floss your teeth. So I just cut the flosser. So I'm always looking at objects in terms of like what I can do with it. Um, the dollar store is like my friend, Hobby Lobby is my friend, and those places just really are inspiring to me. Um, but this kind of led to um, another body of work, and it was, um, as I said, our birth is nothing but our death begun. It's the truth, we're born dying, um, but it's, you know, it wasn't until I had a really dramatic experience where my brother was killed um, while hunting. And uh, this is my family. It's my grandpa and grandma. And there I am, really young. And my brother that was killed is way off to um, your left. And his name's Tommy. And so, and then there's five of us kids. So it was a huge um, loss. Like, you know, because we are so tight knit and it was really dramatic. I didn't make work about it for about six years and I let it sit because I just didn't want to be reactionary and I did other things. And then I just felt, oh, I don't know if I said that's my grandparents. And then I, I started thinking about when my brother died, how I wanted everybody to know that he lived. I wanted to wear a t-shirt that said something. You know, you just want to commemorate them in some way, which we do as a culture, although I think we can be a little bit better about it. Um, but I think that we understand the immediacy of grief. We can understand this emotion. We can all um, sympathize with it. Um, but it's mourning is different. Grief is an inward feeling. Mourning is an outward expression of grief. So it's how you dress or, or what you do or the rituals that you have. <clears throat> and I was really interested in um, that conversation and how um, 
I could reflect on our, um, you know, we're a youth-centric, death-denying culture. And how could I reflect on that? I'm not some artist that makes public sculpture and big, you know, things like that. And I have, you know, that's just not me. So how can I talk about that in a really kind of quiet, um, respectful way? And so I started making these pieces. And, and some of them, I'm not showing all of them. I do have a lot of work. I, I barely showed you any of my work. But um, some of them had to do with like, the death of the moment. You know, like they say, every time you take a photograph, it's a death. Because that moment's never going to live again. And so I really uh, became interested in that idea, you know, where uh, I could also capture you know, I'm no longer, I, I would be so blown away to see the child I was. I have no idea what that would be like to see me as a child. So there's a depth there. I'm no longer that person. Um, and I am definitely altered. And not just by today. Um, <laughs> but, um, so these are some things that we do culturally to um, mourn or grieve for our dead and well, mourn. Um, it's roadside, I'm fascinated by roadside memorials and crosses and how people upkeep those year after year. Um, also, tattoos are a really great memorial um, method. And this is, I was invited as an artist, I think two years ago to Kent State. And the first thing I wanted to see was the memorial to the shootings that happened there. And they literally, this is a parking lot, and they literally like, no, you can't park here, this is a memorial. And there's lights on at night. So, and people bring stones and leave them as a sign of respect. And I thought that was really interesting. Like most places would just like bulldoze it down and put something up. But you literally, at one point, I was like trying to get out of my car next to the memorial with all the posts. And I thought that was really a great way of reminding people of that loss. And there's nothing wrong with being reminded of that loss. It should be part of who you are. It should be part of your life. Um, so, but I still think that we're not very good at dealing with it. So I started looking at the Victorian era, and they took it to a whole new level. Um, wow, they were intense about it. Um, these are post-mortem photographs. So um, the, the, the woman in the middle, her daughter is dead. So it was very common back then to prop people up and take photos of them. Um, Sometimes you didn't know who was dead and who wasn't, you know? Like, there'd be a sibling with the other sibling, like, hey. And it was all <laughs> very weird, but kind of intriguing. And, um, so, yeah, it's just fantastic. It's, it's, I remember when I was 16 and my grandma, Zettel, died, and we went to her funeral, and my uncles were all photographing her. And at the time, I thought, that is so morose. That's, like, totally wrong. You don't photograph the dead. And that is still done today, but it's not at the level that it was done in the Victorian era and, and, and post-Victorian era. Um, so they really were um, all about remembrance and documenting the death. And there was a lot of deaths back then. There was high infant mortality. Kids didn't live very long. Um, so it was, you know, but they were really great at showing their grief and their sorrow publicly. And in their dress, dress as well, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but something that I kind of came upon were these, um, you know, I became interested in the physicality of death, the weight of it, the how it affects you physically. And it really, if anybody's gone through this, um, it's real. Like, it's heavy. You might as well just be four things behind you, right? And so, but these are um, the, the lacrimatories. So basically, these are glass vials. Um, they, they were very popular in the Victoria, Victorian era, which is right here. I'm sorry about the image, but I pulled it off the internet. Um, and they had a special capper on them, and basically the idea was that you would collect your tears and then open it, or the special top would allow them to evaporate, and when it was evaporated, you were done mourning, and then you could move on. Um, that was one idea. They also had them during Roman times, and so the piece um, to your uh, left is a Roman blown, I think it's blown glass, but um, they would hire people to go to funerals and, and mourn and cry. And the more sorrow and all that they made, the more important that person's life was. And so they would collect them and then set them next to the grave. Um, 
So, and, and there are some things from the Bible. Um, thou tell us my wandering, put thou my tears in my bottle, as they are not in my book. And so, no book can talk to you about how difficult it is to mourn and to move through that process. And I just, I, I was really fascinated by these. And there are some contemporary examples of them, but they seem easily made to me. Um, so I decided I wanted to make some of my own. And so I made these pair of glasses that uh, I then took Kleenexes. I think it took me two boxes to actually get this much, um, you know, uh, Kleenexes. So I took the Kleenexes and I pulped them up and then I shoved them into a tube. And that's how I got this form. And I'm also very interested in the ornamentation and kind of the scroll work of the Victorian times. and. Um, which, you know, ornamentation for a while was non-existent, and then it kind of ebbs and flows our level of ornamentation that we, you know, find fashionable or we can handle. Um, but I really do love all of that scroll work, and I love piercing. Um, but I imagine these things, like as you're crying, just going, mm -hmm. you know, like those snakes, those firecrackers that you like, and, go, mm -hmm, and they kind of crawl up. I envision that happening. Um, so even within the series, there's different ideas that are happening. Uh, and this is, you know, another tear catcher. And so this one, I love, like I said, looking at objects. This is a Christmas ornament that I, I sandblasted all the glitter off because it doesn't cast very well. And then what I did was, you know, cut it in half. I, you know, start fabricating over top of it using the invisible man parts, you know, which is always fun. And, um, but the, the entire thing's like a pendant. It opens up. And it has a couple of vials, one's for bubbles, one's for tears, to collect your tears, and one's another one to mix it. It has a pipette, so you can mix your bubbles with your tears, and I love the idea of um, kind of, it seems cathartic to me. You know. um, one of my favorite artists, which I talked a little bit about today with one of you, was Teresa Marboles, who's a Mexican um, artist. She was just in the Venice Biennale a couple years ago, and she mopped the floor with blood of this place. She's very, everything's very visceral. Um, there's a lot of drug trafficking, as we know, that happens, and she, she deals with a lot of the debt that um, comes from that drug trafficking, where if there is an explosion by one of the drug lords of a vehicle, she'll take the glass and have the drug lord's jeweler make a stone and set the glass as a jewel. So it's very subversive in a way, or she has another piece that um, she mixed bubbles with more water from washing the dead bodies, and it just blew into space. It was just bubbles that continually um, moved into space. So I find her work to be really oh, so powerful. I mean, it's so meaningful. Um, you know, and it's beautiful, but it's also critical. I really like that combination of those ideas. Uh, where are we at? Okay, so that's just a close up. All that you can see the little bubble blower here, and that's the little part that the bubbles come out of. Um, I'm not a crier, oddly enough, <laughs> so I've never been able to film one of these. You know? I cry every once in a while, but not very often. I was also interested in hand fans and this idea of weight and the physicality of it. And so, hand fans are something that are very light, really delicate, they create air, they pull you off but I wanted them to seem really heavy and dense. And so I decided that I wanted to make a series of these as well. And so it is, it's a lot like, you know, it's heavy. Like it's like wearing steel boots, you know, to get through the day. And also you'll see, oh, this was stolen. And I, I don't know, but God, the kid stole it? Or, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine. Like, I guess I could speak to multiple people but it was in a gallery and the guy wasn't doing his job and he wasn't watching the space and it was stolen. And I was so pissed. I was like, there is no way this person's going to have that much of me. And so I remade it. And you would think I'd make it better, but I made it worse. <laughs> the second time, I think my heart wasn't in. I'm like, yeah, I'm making it. You know, screw you, God, the soul, the soul, the soul. And the so it was just kind of like a drudgery. Yeah, and, and it wasn't nearly as nice. But anyway, this is out in the world somewhere. The hardest part about the hand fan was stringing it to open and then to close. Like it seems simple, but it was really difficult to figure out, you know, how much slack to have. And you know, the things you think are easy never are. Just like nothing in metal smithing is easy. Never. Uh, just resign yourself to the fact that it's going to be a struggle. 
and it's humbling, right? I am humbled every single day I sit down on my bench because I'm always screwing up, I'm always making mistakes. It's just such an amazing experience. Eight hours at my bench can go by like that, and I don't even know they went by. It's, it's a really nice meditative space. Um, but I, I know that you saw the, the skulls and skeletons and things like that, but I know it's very much about pop culture today, but it really was, it did have different meaning. I mean, it was, oh, it was supposed to create comfort, right? It was supposed to be like, hey, don't worry, you're going to be here soon. You know, this is what you're going to be doing too. And so, um, but it, 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 of course, it's meaning changes all the time and, and how we see it. And, um, so I love the rosary. <coughs> Um, the back of the bead with the, the skull is really quite lovely. Um, but it just is a reminder of our mortal state. And I find that I'm obsessed with this idea. Um, yeah, I just feel like it's easier on me knowing that, you know, this is going to happen. This is going to happen every day. I keep saying that, but it's the most that's true. Um, this is, sometimes I'll take different, I want to experiment with different styles of hand fans. Um, this one being the paddle style and um, the, you know, just, oh yeah, it, it, it's really interesting how you figure these things out, leave the gap for the thickness to come through. And it is, I do make my pets, I'll make them out of cardboard and they're really rough and terrible looking, but they do really serve their purpose. I'm always telling my students, make them on pet. Make them on cat. I need to know how much metal you're going to use. You need to know how much metal. It's really, that never goes away, um, making that study. Uh, but anyway, it's a cake server that turned into the handle, and there's an interior scene. I don't know if you can see it, but I, I found that whenever bad news is presented, and I remember the day that I found out about my brother dying, I was in my office at school. I was getting ready for an exhibition, and my husband came in to tell me. I was like, oh my god, I'm so excited. Did you skip out of work? Are you rollerblading? What's going on? He said, I sit down. And so, yeah, it was like this really, like, and everything just went silent, you know? And it's that same thing where all of a sudden you notice the port on the phone. You notice something that stick that's burned into your brain. And so I feel like this quiet interior scene kind of says that. And um, this one is another paddle style with the crow, which of course is a, you know, in many cultures a sign of death. Um, but I really did have, I love casting artificial flowers. That's so much fun too, dipping them in wax. I love the process of casting. I just can't seem to get enough of it. It just really makes me happy. Um, and then this one is a lot of the people that have passed on my family. Again, it's becoming a little narrative. Um, but I really wanted to etch their faces, like almost like a book, like it reads like a book. And I think a fan is very similar to book art in the way that it opens and operates. And um, so I really, I had so much fun making this piece that, you know, of course it's a nightmare on different things. It's, it's all good. And I love the plastic skull and, and kind of the combination of that. And speaking of the physicality of death, you know, just, oh, this is a close up, sorry. Um, there's also, you know, the idea of all you can do to get through the day is just to remind yourself to breathe. And so I was giving a lecture at Oxbow, and one of the um, uh, glass artists was like, can I make you something? I'm like, yeah. So he made me these glass forms that look like they're being inhaled back in the oil. And so I used them right away. I was so fascinated by them, and I thought they were so delicate and ephemeral, and I wanted to use the silver with it. And so that's how that came um, to this um, space. Uh, another, this is more recent work. I've been taking my brother's clothing and actually using it. You know, you don't know what to do with all this stuff. I started making quilts for my family, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but I really became interested in that weight, like shackles and the weight of his clothing being in bronze. Uh, and again, metal's very heavy, and I like playing with that idea. I have other ideas, too. I want to, like, um, cast his weight in concrete and make it into a necklace and try to drag it. He was like 150. I want to see if I can make that weight and do something more performative. I know that a lot of my work is performative in nature, but I don't really perform with it. I get that question a lot too. It's like, why don't you do performance? Or, uh, and, but I'm just so happy at being that performative object that I, you know, and I do photograph myself with them. I think they need that. We kind of talked about that today. Like my work, 
can't really function most of it without an accompanying photograph. And so photography becomes really important to me um, and how I present those ideas. Uh, but anyway, this was a Gap t-shirt of his. It cast so well that the gap and the size of it even showed up on the inside. Uh, and then I kind of cut it in half and it's hinged. You can see the snowflake. But all I do is dip it in wax. I dip it in sculpture wax and I pull it out and I dip it again and then I take a torch to it to make sure the wax is all inside of it and it's proper weight. And, um, but I don't want to lose the texture of the fabric. So there's no mold making here at all. Uh, the same with the cuffs. Uh, these are his uh, work clothes. He was a machinist. And so I took um, this one particular shirt that I was really attracted to that was really torn out and, and cast that. And, I, and they are, they're like really, they just kind of pull you down. And I love that that feeling and that weight of the pieces. Um, and then another shirt collar. Uh, the buttons are his buttons too, but I took holds of them and um, was really happy with the outcome of this. I'm also interested in mourning and the landscape of the body and how um, it's just not a physical thing, but it's also um, something a little bit different. So we think about, we put ourselves underground, we have tombstones, there's this um, kind of cloaking or um, the landscape kind of cloaks us. And I love that idea. And so I wanted to start to play with these forms that are, there's a, wax, it's skin wax, and basically it's a low melting wax that you can dip your body parts into, and it's not going to burn you. And so that's what I was using for these, was the skin wax, and it's a really fantastic um, wax to use if you just want it. My son's even, like, he puts his little fingers in it and doesn't burn them, so you know it's all right. It's like that therapy stuff for your hands, it's similar to that. Um, but I like this idea that I was becoming the landscape and there is a stillness and this quiet um, to it. And I was thinking of moments that were meaningful to me, such as, you know, my grandparents' camp and the wildlife there, or, because I've lost my grandpa, I lost my dad, I lost my sister. It's not just about my brother. These are significant losses that I feel like if I don't live my life to the fullest, their life is meaningless. And so I have to live for them, is the way that I see my role. I know it's a little intense, but you know, I, I, I think we can all relate to that from having lost. So, but I think sometimes silence is so much more powerful than speaking. Um, flowers. See how incredible it really picks up a lot of detail. I, I really, I really like working with that. Um, so here you can see the the shroud, the coffin. I did a little research. I didn't know that pallbearers at one time didn't carry the coffin. They actually walked along beside the coffin and held the the pall cloth on the top as a sign of respect. And so there was no carrying of the weight. And um, so I became really interested in this idea of this covering. Um, just like the, the flag over top of the soldier's grave. I'm, I'm very fascinated by that too. So um, this is just part of the map. This is the topographical map. He was killed while hunting. This guy thought he was a turkey and shot him. And so he's up near my grandparents' camp, and this is just a segment of the um, topographical map, which I had printed at a company called Spinflower, and we'll print anything on fabric, anything, like just whatever you can think of. And so I used this as my map, and so I made, I took his height and his width of what I could remember, and I made it into a, and this is out of order, so I apologize, but anyway, I made it into a more plot. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. This is another artist, um, Charles Simmons, who I'm really fascinated from the 70s. He, um, did, he basically used his body as the landscape and built these small, tiny architectural structures over his entire um, body. And so he was a clay artist that worked very conceptually. Um, so, and you can see a lot of stuff. I think there's a piece of his of the Art Institute going down the steps to the um, museum store that's kind of in the wall, uh, but he's dealing really with his own personal mythology, and I find that to be one of the, you know, in this imaginary civilization, um, I, I just love it. It's really a microcosm for our life. Uh, another person's work that I'm really inspired by is Anna Mendiata, who they say Carl Andre killed his wife, pushed her out the window. I don't know if that's true or not, but she died very early. Um, and they think she was killed. 
But a lot of her work deals with death, feminism, um, her body specifically, and I really love the interactions that she has with the earth, especially the piece to the left where you know these things are growing past her body or they have that impression. And so I think uh, if you get the chance, you should really look at her work. It's really uh, so intense. To What's her name again? Anna, A-N-A, Mendiata. And, um, but it brings me back to this piece where this is the actual map that I made. It took me all summer and I took his clothing, I dyed it different colors and so the darker pieces were lower topographical spots and then the lighter pieces were the higher topographical spots. I did beading, I beaded the railroad, the railroad that went by, I had different beads that signified a house, I had different beads that, so there's kind of a language that was set up within the space. Um, that we all understand maps to have. And uh, this is kind of a close up. So you can see his bedding. My parents, my mom bought him uh, outdoors and had like moose and fish and stuff on it. But you can kind of see the moose head. Um, and his jeans and some more of his shirts. And you can see the, the pathways and everything. So, and then I asked my dad to um, put the star, because I was six months pregnant when this happened, so I'd never been up there. And so I asked him to put the star, and this was my brother's star from childhood, his little cowboy star, and I gold leafed it. And my dad put it on the spot um, where he was killed, which is oddly enough, exactly on the same place in my body. It was right here, and it was you know, it all went here. Uh, so then I, I hired somebody, because I'm not that good of a seamstress, to do the bell rhythm on the outside and kind of true it up. Um, because what I didn't realize is through the quilting process, the whole thing was true. It was really unexpected. Um, but I really do love this idea of, of things kind of laying over the body or becoming one with the, with the uh, landscape. Uh, and then again, back to the Victorian times, this is an um, example of Widow's Week, which was what they would wear, depending on who died, it would be how long you were in the state of mourning. Uh, it could be anywhere from a couple weeks to two years. Um, you also did not just like stop mourning. You had to... Um, wean yourself out of mourning. So it went from black, it's wearing grays and lavenders, and then you kind of went it back into normal clothing. And if you didn't do this, it was sexually explicit. Like they, you just thought, they thought, oh, well, look at her, she's gonna go off and find another husband. And, you know, so there was really a lot, this, a lot of the mourning was put on the woman. Uh, the men wore maybe an armband, or they wore something along their hat, like a, a, a felted ribbon or a crepe but the women really did bear the brunt of the mourning, um, which is very common in most cultures, actually. And uh, poor women, they, they, they had to just get on with it. They had to find another husband, they had to move on. So um, the wealthier women were able to take on more of that mourning responsibility. So, but I really love how they negotiated, you know, the rituals and the set, um, time frames for mourning. I know it's not as organic as they're making it out, or, you know, it's more organic than they're making it out to be. Uh, and then, of course, I'm really fascinated by, you know, vulcanite, which is thermoplastic, that they use with um, uh, gouda percha, which is molded tree resin, uh, jet, which is a form of coal, and so you can see a lot of that. So even their jewelry was very matted, there's nothing bright. Um, and actually, the one on the left I have a tattoo of, it's a German morning brooch. And the woman that made it all popular, Queen Victoria. So her husband, Prince Albert, died, and she never recovered from his death, and she mourned the day that she died. And so this is an example of how jewelry and ornamentation and fashion influence culture. Because she went into this deep state of mourning, everybody thought it was fashionable to do the same thing. And that's how we ended up with this intense mourning practice, is because she started it, unknowing that this would happen. And then it came to the Americas, and um, it kind of tapered off in the early um, 1900s. It wasn't as popular to do that, because people were going off to World War I, and there's a lot of people dying, but they were dying remotely. They weren't dying, you know, as in the Civil War here. And it just, you know, funeral homes started popping up. So all of that started to change. And so mourning then became secluded again. And it became very personal. It wasn't as outward. And um, so but we 
still have things that like stay with us, flowers for one. I don't know if you know why flowers are at funerals, but it's to mask the stench. Um, and that's like something that we still do, or funeral processions with the cars. Of course it was walking and carts and things like that, but those things are still with us. There's still some of that. Um, and then I became really inspired. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna like totally make black clothes and we'll do this for a year, see if I can do it. And like I stupidly picked the worst clothes. Like I picked this 1950s ball gown and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna make that. It's not practical. And then all this sewing took up so much of my time that I wasn't able to take care of my family. When that happens, I'm just not interested anymore. You know, because my son is prime, right? And so I thought, plus I was so stressed by it and I was making stupid decisions, but I wanted to see if I could go into a state of mourning, outward mourning for a year. And uh, it didn't work with the clothing. And my husband's like, why don't you just make like one outfit seven times and just wear that every day? And I'm like, no, I need variety. <laughs> you know, of course, I might be able to do it now, but. So what I did was I decided to alter my approach. And so this is uh, Objects of Morning Liminality. So I was um, kind of referencing, so basically what I did, I guess, step back, was I made a brooch every day. So if I had to go to a snack conference or something, I had a pack of morning kit. So I had like all the little black things and the beads, and I'm like, with my little morning box, I'm like, I can't go drink or I can't go to that lecture, I gotta make brooch. I'm like in the room trying to make a brooch, and some days they were very intense and I got really involved in, other days it was like, I, it, it was anything, it, it just took me everything just to sew like something together once. And so it became, so anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, I spent every day just kind of contemplating, thinking about the people I've lost, thinking about the process of mourning, kind of finding myself, wow, of all the things I've ever done, this was the most playful. I got to experiment like crazy. I used plastics, I used velvet, I used beading, I used, I was like taking heat guns to like tool, and I was doing all this wonderful stuff that really was at the end of the day. And um, at the end of the year, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like, I, I thought maybe I could start working like, I didn't know what to do. And my daughter was like, God, this is so weird. She put this like, ball and chain, you know, attached to you. But I found, too, that um, my role in contemporary society would that be that of a man in, you know, the Victorian era. So a man has to, he was making money, getting down to business, doing what he had to do. He didn't have time to sit there and mourn. And I feel that my, that happened to me. Like, I didn't have time to really fully throw myself into it. And I feel that the brooches, though, were um, in some ways more meditative. They, they allowed me not to be so overwhelmed by it. They, they were, became a signifier. So every day my students would be like, oh, what do you have on? What's that about? And we talk a little bit about it. So it really did help form some connections and um, broach the subject of mourning and death. So. Um, but the, then I got a grant, and I hired a student to help me, but then I, I sewed them, it was like 210 feet of velvet and satin ribbon, and every day of the year was beaded on it, and that's how they were displayed. So it's called liminality, which is the space in between. So in the gallery, I wanted to look like a scar or a cut um, through that space. And this thing's been cut apart so many times and pieced together, it's just insane. I did our prize. Most people I know Grand Rapids now by Art Price. Um, and so this was in Art Price. Um, oh, I was next to the woman that came in third. I was like, oh, I wanted her to do really well, but inside I was like, don't let her be first, because I don't want to be the biggest loser next to the first. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's a little stressful. <laughs> Especially when no one's looking at your work and they're looking over it to see hers. Good thing I have a good sense of self-esteem. Um, but this is a close-up of one of them. Like you know, like I said, I was kind of having funny fun and enjoying the interaction and um, just. But it's constant work. It really, really is constant work. Um, and this is just kind of another view. But you can see the different processes and materials. On one of the day, um, this is kind of really TMI, but. Um, my dad dug out of the tree behind where my brother was shot one of the pellets from the shotgun. And one of the days I actually wore it, I nestled it in some tool. And so that was a pretty intense day. You know, it, it depends. Sometimes I was using my grandfather's clothing, my, my dead 
cat's hair. And so I was trying to tie all those things into it. Which brings me to morning is remnants. And I'll speed it up here, but I'm obsessed with hair jewelry. And um, this is all woven hair. This is a hair tree. They made hair wreaths and they have different um, generations of family. Um, this piece I actually own, it's falling apart, but I got it on eBay for $50. And so I have this little mini collection of hair jewelry. And I love that hair's so intimate and it's so, it's, if it's not used right, we're typically grossed out by it. Once it's off our head, we're like, mm -hmm. but <laughs> you can like do things with it and like braid it and do wonderful little things. And so I became really interested in their clothing. And so the clothing in this series of senses, um, it touches the body. And so I really, my dad died when I was four going on five. He died of cancer. He was 33. And um, this was the last piece of clothing that my mother had. And it was his um, bathrobe. So I really loved where it touched the body and became very intimate because clothing is as intimate as your skin. And so I did a series. And this was my brother. He had this very beautiful voice. And this is one of his um, shirts. You can see that cut out, that scroll work, um, this long underwear shirt. And my grandpa always smelled so lovely. He always had this great cologne on. And so, But I was allowing my desires to um, decide what I was going to make. And then it turned into some brooches. Um, very interested in, you know, um, kind of pinning them on the body and not having the typical brooch um, faceted, you know, how it facets the body. I want it to be a little, little more aggressive. Uh, the backs of them had etchings of them when um, they are alive. I'm very interested in Lincoln, too. I'm obsessed with President Lincoln. <laughs> and these things, like the country was just in such a moment. I mean, it was just horrendous. I think it was just such a huge loss for so many people. And I've always been very interested in him as a man. I'm, I'm interested in the Civil War just in general. Um, but then I wanted to start making things that really hurt and created pain and um, still had their clothing. And, and so this is all nails and it kind of hangs on the skin and that's some of my brother's hair. Uh, because we, like I said, we had all these clothes of theirs that my family had kept over the years and I started making quilts out of them, just really simple quilts. And it meant so much to my family to receive those. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting how you know, you can still keep those things and transform that object and heal somebody in the process. And my work is very much about therapy. I'm not going to sit here and say, ooh, it's not, but it really is. Um, this is my grandpa's, two of them, the clothing and the fish hook. Oh, that hurt when it was on my back. But I only have the last for the photos. Okay, and here you can see uh, these are glasses or goggles with all my brother's clothing. Um, so I just love this idea of their clothes as being something that I can work with as a material because it has so much meaning. Um, I'm also obsessed with Victorian um, ether masks. They used to use them to kind of calm people down, calm them out, um, and they sometimes walk around with them on, like, <laughs> so bizarre. I love how structured they are and how beautiful and the stitching. So I started creating uh, versions of that. And that's his work um, jeans in his pocket. And this is, I actually typed in his one name one time. I was interested. I just, I'll Google anything. I was like, Tommy Zettel. And it came up with this thing from my aunt that was like talking about that day. And it was totally unexpected. So I etched that in the surface. And it kind of does talk about language and the inability to speak about it. Uh, and I've been becoming more and more interested in obituaries because they're, only, they're the last things that are left of us. Uh, they really are. I mean, our clothing will disperse, it'll start rotting, it'll go in the dump, who knows where it's going to go. But the obituary is the only thing that our dust certificate is over really here. And so his obituary is in the back of that. Um, more of their clothing, when I'm deconstructing it and crocheting it back together, and they kind of hinder the body. They create these very private moments, um, which this one, where it's kind of shielding the face, like some of the Victorian uh, widow's weeds with the, the veil. And this is all their um, hand-pierced contours. And um, 
I'm also starting, we won't go through this one, but um, I love this quote, between the doors of birth and death stands yet another door, holy and ex explicable. He who is able to be born at the door of death is devoted eternally. And I love the saying, um, die before dying, die living. And so that just mantra always sticks in my mind. I am obsessed, I'm not going to lie. I really do feel this obsession. And now I'm starting to um, get away from using recognizable things in my work, such as gas masks, glasses. We, that, that design is already designed for us, right? That form's done. We're just, I'm just playing with it and altering it. But making a necklace or a brooch, that's so intense to me because none of that information is given to me. I have to create that information myself. And so it's really stressful and it's really challenging me. So this is some of their um, clothing. There's some of the squares and dipped in black paint and then their images are on the back. Um, I've had some things laser etched his obituary and these teardrops, which I'm making these forms for. I also gave myself a project where he was 27, so I thought, I thought okay, I'm going to try to like capture his um, face, like his silhouette. I have 27 attempts to see if I can really remember what he looked like. So much of that fades away. And I think I got it, but I, none of these show it. Sorry, I, did, I didn't. I do have one. And I've also started deconstructing. That's my clothes. I wore this shirt. It's so feminine for me. But I wore it um, while I was pregnant, and I started deconstructing it down to its thread. And then I took my brother's shirt and started deconstructing it down to the thread and started weaving my clothes into his. I saw this phenomenal movie one time on this female vampire, I think it's in Bulgaria. It's a true story. She was killing all these peasant girls and bathing in their blood. And then she started killing the nobles and the noble women, and that's when she got into deep crap, right, with everybody. And so she became obsessed because she was older and she had a lover who was much younger and she, when he was sleeping, cut his hair and slit her chest open and sewed his hair into her chest. I thought, that is so gross and so wonderful at the same time. <laughs> so that's my, uh, that's my attempt, you know, like deconstructing something down to its element and then putting it back together. Oh, by the way, that's why I've been using all my little slides for it. I have little looms. If you want to know what to use your old slides for, those of us old enough to have slides, I make little looms out of them, so there's a slide. So, uh, but that's where I'm kind of heading right now, learning illustrator. Uh, so I am done. That's why I'm doing it. 
you know, that's why I, I like talking about it, and that's why I obsess over it, so that I hope I can help somebody else. I've also started um, doing hospice work. I chose this woman. You can select people that you can work with, and do you want to work in home, or do you want to work in a center? And so I thought, oh, I'll start at a center. This woman is 103 years old. She just turned 103, and I thought, you know, I got into this wanting to help people, and I'm okay with death, and I can handle it. Um, and I thought, I'm going to be help here. I, be, I swear to you, I'm going to die before she does. Every time I go back, so instead of learning about death, I've learned about longevity and the power and will of the human being to keep going on. Like, and that was so unexpected. Like, I swear, every time I go to see her, I'm like, yeah, I'm probably going to die before she does. She's just like, and she eats like a horse. I'm like, stop eating and you're going to die. Like, in my mind, I'm like, just stop eating. Uh, oh, and then 
Catholicism and fine art and um, all the imagery and things. And she does these things when she lectures. She's like, all right, who's Catholic? And it's always like Catherine and then it's artist. And so I think there's that, that mix too. I don't know if that helps, but it really is that um, unexciting.
easygoing, outgoing, generally super happy, sometimes irritated person, you know, that I, I feel like it's, it, it, no, it's not too much. I, what became too much for me was when I was um, doing the research on war and veterans and logging their stories. I was so fascinated by how that experience altered them in so many different ways, and I wanted to hear about that. And that became, somehow listening to their story, it became a lot for me. I had to step away from it. So I also thought I felt caught in the narrative structure that I didn't want to be in. I wanted to make things that were a little bit more or less defined. But no, it doesn't, it doesn't face me in the least. It really doesn't. Yeah, I think dealing with children and dying, that's different than adults. That would, I have a different perspective. Uh, throughout your presentation, you use the word object quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible for you to give us your definition of an object? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, an object is so many things. Just like the jewelry club is named object, I thought that was really interesting. Um, because um, I see an object as being a, um, a dimensional form, and that dimensional form can be paper. Um, so and it's a form that we construct, that we make, um, or that is from nature, you know, like a tree can also be an object, but I primarily see objects as things that, we, that are made of our, like our making. That's why it's artifacts from self-making. So we make these things and then they define us. Um, whether we intend them to define who we are or not. It's just like James Elkins, I love, his, he writes on the object stairs back, and he talks about how the things that we surround ourselves with speak volumes about who we are. So those objects, those things that we wear, the scarf, the pants, the way we wear our hair, which is also an object, um, that says more about us than us talking verbally. So it, it does, it kind of turns on itself and it reflects who you are. And that's one of the most interesting. But I see pretty much everything in this world is an object. I don't see it as being one thing. Uh, for time, we should make this the last question okay. so that the audience has a break. But everyone's welcome to come up and talk to our artists because the artists always <coughs> take 15 minutes during the break. So please come up and ask more questions to our So you, you talked in your lecture a lot about um, death and, and, and mourning, and then there was a lot of imagery that, imagery that had to do with mortality. Almost feels like some of the actions that you're doing is, is combating that um, that mortality and kind of immortalizing certain memories. How, how do you feel about memory? I, I remember once hearing somebody say something that like every time we remember something, we either embellish it or we lose part of the actual accurate. truth. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, it's not accurate at all. Are you trying to fight some of that too to like um, yeah. make that more concrete? I am. I'm trying to. Um, I'm trying to um, encapsulate it and try to um, hold it and, and, and yes, make it more concrete, but in that I'm hoping to not come up with a specific memory or, I mean, maybe with my brother's silhouette, yes, like a specific idea, but I am trying to um, immortalize him and my loved ones and because, you know, we're just a speck. We're really not. I mean, when you think about all of time, and here we are in this small world of metal smithing and art. And it, I don't want to demean it, but it's really, it's so small in comparison. Like, I'm so overwhelmed by the entirety of our situation as human beings. And I think that's what I'm trying to do, is to kind of understand our humanity and understand how we treat one another. <coughs> Yeah, like how we relate. I think that that work helps me do that. Uh, I don't know if it helps other people do that, but it's really, yeah, I'm just really interested in us as people and how we deal with things and how we move through things. And I don't know if that answered it, but it is a bit of like bronze and baby shoes. And my work is really definitely that. I can't, I'm not going to be able to sell any of this. <laughs> I can sell my work anyway. Um, there's a few pieces and commissions, but. 
Um, it's too personal. It is. I mean, I'm talking about speaking universally, but nobody wants somebody else's dead relative's clothing. <laughs> you know, I try giving away its nag, you know. <laughs> creating that space of memory and allowing me to reflect. But that's more in the process. That's not in the outcome of the work. That's like more personal to me when I sit down at the bench. But the outcome is a little bit 